welcome to the Mayor's Office. This is the forum for Pacifica's mayors to talk shop with regional leadership about nothing, everything. How's the weather? How's your dog, your cat? How about that war in Israel? Anything. So my name is Tiger Jazz Twirls Big Stick. Usually at this point I introduce myself as the mayor. I'm doing it a little differently tonight. Uh, for me it's nighttime while we're taping. So the story goes that I had an appointment to tape an episode with the final guest of the year while I was still mayor. And due to extenuating circumstances that we are about to go into, uh, we were not able to keep that date. And so as a result, uh, we're a little bit past that time that I was mayor. But this show is designed fundamentally to be a forum, as I said before, for the mayor. And the way I thought I would end my time doing this show would be by passing the show on to the new mayor. And I wanted to do that while I still had a gavel metaphorically in hand, but it occurred to me, no time like the present, and it's still a good idea, I think, to um, pass the, again, metaphorical torch, as it were. So without too much more ado and uh, a lot more talking uh, with somebody else, this is our new mayor in the year 2024, Sue Vaterlaus. Thank you, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you tonight. Thank you for having me. My, you know, thank you for being here, and thank you for having... So this is like this whole chicken and egg thing. I okay. guess technically I... Uh, but, you know, the idea... Big, you, can, you can squawk back if you want to. It's all right. Okay. Okay, or not. <laughs> um, but this really is intended to be your office, and that's the point of this show, uh, at least this episode, is to pass it on to you. And so I figure it's a great opportunity for Pacifica to get to new, know their new mayor. That's the way I intended it when you were a stone's throw from being a mayor, and now that you are mayor, I have the pleasure as not the mayor of interviewing the new mayor, and I think I've now um, driven that so far into the ground we should talk about something substantive. Okay. Um, and I, I think I'm a little nervous because I get I... to interview the mayor, and I've never done that before. <laughs> I appreciate being the new mayor. Um... This will be my second round, but um, I look forward to getting some things done this year with the council because we all obviously work together. The, the mayor is not like the mayor in some other cities. Um, we don't have really any extra power. All of the council works together and they all have equal power. Well, equal power except for that one extra duty that is incumbent the, upon the mayor. There are a lot of things that the mayor does that not everybody does. Um, the reporters often call the mayor. Um, the public tends to contact the mayor more than all the council. Um, we kind of have duties of talking to other elected officials. Everybody does that but sometimes the mayors uh, take that a little further. And we all tend to know all the elected officials now, which is really a nice, a great thing to have. It's really important for us to have that cohesiveness with the other mayors and the other elected officials that are around us um, because they're important for our city. And and knowing people makes a big difference. Makes a huge difference and having friends across the region who then can look for opportunities with you um, so that as a region we kind of become a unit and a body. And without doing that work of reaching out to our counterparts and other jurisdictions in the county, we get to miss opportunities. Um, you are somebody who I noticed quickly would attend uh, what they call Council of Cities meetings. And cluing into that this is a thing, I tried to follow suit as quickly as I could as a new council person. And as somebody who tried to emulate, frankly, um, your very good habit of always being present at those Council of Cities meetings, I was able to kind of um, follow in those footsteps and see what it's like forming those relationships, which you were doing for years before I was ever elected, or frankly, before I thought I might be elected. 
Um, Council of Cities is probably one of my favorite events to attend because all the 20 cities, occasionally the county, um, is involved. So you get to meet council people from every city. You have a learning experience. It's always something about learning. But you also go through the process of breaking bread. You eat a meal with them. You talk to different people each time. Um, I loved the Council of Cities from the first day I went because I met so many people. I was brand new. I was um, on the council for maybe two days before I attended my first Council of Cities meeting and I met so many people. And I later, a couple of years later, not too long, I became the vice chair of Council of Cities. And then because of COVID and a lot of things happening, I was the chair, but I was the chair, I believe, three times. Wow. So because, well, a lot of things happened, but I had a vice chair who just kind of dropped off the face of the earth. So um, I continued on and did that. I did meetings during COVID. Hopefully your vice Zoom. chair then isn't still unelected. The, uh, the person is not. Okay. Okay. okay, very good, so, very good. But, but I really, I, I would go every single chance I got. I've made such good friends there. And it's when someone wants to talk about, for example, if San Bruno wanted to talk about fireworks, yep, they would call me and say, because they do fireworks, are you guys doing fireworks? And we could have a conversation about what was happening around that subject. And it makes it so much easier when that other mayor picks up the phone on a Sunday and says, hey, how are you doing today? Yep. Just how are you doing today? Uh, Rico Medina, the mayor uh -huh. of San Bruno, who has been for quite a while, also uh, picked up the phone and chatted with me a couple of times leading up to 4th of July. And it was really nice to touch base with the only other community in San Mateo County who are doing safe and sane fireworks and have those discussions a bit. And Correct. not only those relationships that are formed at Council of Cities, which, you know, that's kind of what this forum is about. You know, it's a cup of tea, a glass of water, and then we can just talk about whatever. But it's also, you go to the different cities and they show you what they're working on. It's amazing sometimes the, um, a new library, a new city hall, um, a police station. It's, it's just amazing what some of the cities have accomplished. Um, and, and it's nice to see it. It's, sometimes we're jealous, but yeah. that's okay. Well, given how long we've been craving a new library mm -hmm. and then to see one pop up in Brisbane and Atherton and Half Moon Bay, mm -hmm. see how beautiful they are, to see the uh, the different features that are available to people that I, I think often people don't know because we don't have them at our library. In, in Half Moon Bay, we got to <clears throat> tromp through the mud um, and walk over boards because they were showing us the progress of their new library. And, and it was a fun event, you know? Yeah. Everybody wearing hard hats and just imagining what it was gonna look like and then going back there when it was totally completed and just seeing the finished product. And it was amazing. Right? Amazing. Amazing. And frankly, even um, Brisbane, which is comparatively a, a smaller area, the architecture is really lovely. Mm -hmm. And they have some of the m most beautiful murals you could, you could want to have. And, and um, art, sculpture installations where light is playing and for such a small space, it feels big. And it's, it's beautiful and the resources are all there. And so I'm looking forward to uh, uh, seeing what the li where the library advisory committee brings us. And yes. So uh, first ground rule, because I'm kind of now skirting the edges of it, and it's the only ground rule for those of you who are watching is simply we need to kind of make sure we're not talking about city business that'll be coming before us and 
without going deep into library. We know that's coming up, so we should probably. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I began by saying that we had an appointment scheduled where we were going to do this prior, and then I believe something came up that um, uh, prolonged this episode being taped uh, a little further down the road. Um, though I've gotten your permission prior to this taping to discuss such things, I feel uh, it's your news to share. Do you recall why it is that first taping uh, had to be pushed back a little? Um, yes. Um, well, I'm going to start a little earlier than that. Okay. Um, the, a few days before Relay for Life, um, and I'm going to be personal here, so I had a mammogram. And they said, you need to come back for additional testing. And about three days before relay, um, I had additional testing. And I looked into the eyes of the doctor who did the biopsy. And I asked him. I could tell from his eyes. And I said, do I have cancer? And he said, yes, you have cancer. That was a few days before Relay. And I got up at, at Relay for Life and my main goal, which is still one of my big goals, is to tell people to go and get your mammograms. Men, do your self-exams. Women, do your self-exams. Because the earlier they catch it, the better. Um, the things that you go through when, when you're told you have cancer, um, am I going to die? Am I going to live? And, and I will say that about two weeks ago I asked my oncologist, because I thought it was an important question, what are my odds now of living my life? And she said, now that you've gone through these treatments that you've gone through, I'm going to give you a better than 90% chance to live. And to me, that makes everything worthwhile because all of my goal in all of the things that I've gone through are to live. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to live the rest of my life. I mean, anybody could walk outside and get hit by a car. We say that all the time. But um, I am not going to let this cancer beat me. On occasion, I felt like it has. But um, at this moment, I'm doing a lot better and um, happy to be here. And when you say treatments, and maybe you did say it, and it just, I was focused on the other C word, mm -hmm. um, that being cancer, by the way, I'm not afraid to say it. But um, what kind of treatments have you been having up until now? Um, I had a surgery to remove the cancer. Um, that was a pretty big surgery. Um, then after probably about a month of healing from that, um, I had chemotherapy. Um, I've undergone four treatments of chemotherapy. In the very first treatment, I lost all my hair, um, which I had probably more hair than this wig. Um, so I did lose all of my hair. Um, the treatments for chemo, chemo is a poison. They put it in and it kills everything. It, um, it causes every hair to fall out. Every hair. Your nose hair, I mean your ear hair, your leg hair, everything just falls out. And, and at first, that was really depressing for me because my hair was falling out in giant clumps. And then the positiveness you have to have. I had to say to myself, well, I know that it's reaching every part of my body because it's making all of my hair fall out. So that means that the chemo is working and it's doing its job. That's a heck of a silver lining. Well, you kind of have to. You know, not every, it occurs to me, not everyone, it seems, is able to put a positive spin on it in that way. I, I don't know if you borrowed that from someone else or somewhere else, or, but if that's what just naturally occurred to you, 
that tells me something about your nature, which to my sensibility is rather extraordinary. Oh, it, I, I have to be that way because you have to be positive going forward. It, it not only makes your hair fall out, it um, makes you ill, you have a fever. You, um, my biggest problem during chemo was that the food, it, I, I used to tell people that I couldn't taste food. It wasn't that I couldn't taste food. It's that everything I tasted, tasted like the bottom of a garbage can a Ritz cracker I had to spit out, some oatmeal, very benign food items, water tasted like metal. Um, it was difficult at times because you're trying to recover from having this poison put in your body and yet the food that sustains you and gives you energy you can't have. So I'm, I'm really hoping that someday, I, I asked a doctor recently, you know, in your next trials, can you try to find something that will allow people to eat? Because I realize the importance of eating. Because if you don't eat for several days, then you don't have the energy to do anything else. So it just, um, it continued, it's cumulative. My last chemo was December 15th, which I was assuming I would be just fine at Christmas, and I wasn't. Because it adds up in your body and my body just kind of said you had enough. Um, I don't know if you want details, but I mean, I, I had a fever for 13 days straight. And when you have a fever, you know how you feel. You have the flu. Sometimes people say, oh my God, I'm never gonna get better. And you kind of go through that in your head. And then again, you have to find the positive side and say, well, I've had the flu before. It's gonna end. I'm gonna be better in the end. And it took a while, but I am finally getting better from December 15th. It was a trip watching you go through that and you know, because it, it was months. It was. And knowing that it was building up to the point where you were about to take over that gavel. And I know you thought about it and you thought, well, I could deny it and let someone else take it. I had one evening where I was, you know, sometimes you just don't feel the same. and. I went, I, I think I can't do council anymore. I maybe can't do real estate anymore. And it lasted one evening where I was probably feeling sorry for myself about what I was going through. And I woke up the next day and went, no way, no way. I've, I've never quit anything. The fact that I couldn't attend two council meetings while I was going through this was huge for me. Because in all the other years that I've been on council, I never missed a meeting. I am not a sick person. Um, I don't go places because if I am committed to something, I'm going to do it. And it, I felt bad. One of the times I was so sick, but I was trying to watch the entire council meeting. Um, but it wasn't easy. So. I believe it. So uh, we turned over the gavel and mm -hmm. you went through your last chemo, which sucked for upwards of two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then it's been nice, light and rosy ever since, right? Nothing really has been going on in town and you're just oh, um, fully goodness. recovered now, right? No. <laughs> um, so many things have happened. It kind of reminds me of Ray Mueller. Because remember how they like had to call him back from Disneyland before the swearing-in date to be like, yeah, all hell's breaking loose and the th th next three months of your life are going to be atmospheric rivers and you should be here for it. Oh, and by the way, there's a shooting now. Um, you know, yes. okay, so it's not quite a shooting. It's just a, a small stabbing and holy, you know, something like that in our community. And then on top of that, having those king tides the way they are, 
and it, it's kind of like a, a small version of what we got to watch Ray go through. And then on top of that, okay, you're finally getting past the chemo, and? Then uh, in, in this long fever um, episodes, they uh, discovered I have a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in my lung, which can be caused by cancer or chemo or surgery all of which I had, um, so they don't really know what caused it. Um, it makes it difficult to breathe. So while we were having the king tides, I was um, having difficult breathing time and still had a fever for another four more days. And it, uh, so I'm taking additional medication for that. And this but is where having a good support team comes in handy. The, I have had the best support that you could ever imagine. I did go down on the day of the king tides. Um, it was not an easy trek for me just to go like three blocks because I was having difficulty breathing, but. By the way, if ever you're suffering from a pulmonary embolism, don't go out to check out the king tides. The correct response is stay home, let the blood clots break up, and so that way you don't, you know, inadvertently die, perhaps. Um, but it was really important for me to go there because I knew the damage it was causing. Um, I knew that there would be a lot of people. Um, I happened to get there exactly at the same time as Sue Beckmeyer. So we... You're Mayor Pro Tem. The Mayor Pro Tem. So we um, went together and talked to many, many people about what they thought should happen, about things that we might be voting on sometime later. So we'll keep it vague. We will keep it vague. <laughs> but you know, wave stuff, ocean stuff. A lot of wave and ocean <laughs> things. The amazing things that the ocean did, um, the benches that are made out of concrete, which are no longer upright, crushed. A tree, probably 30 feet long, that got um, pulled up the ocean, took it right into the side of um, a steel fence and smashed the fence, um, watching cars sliding on TV, watching the people get knocked down. I talked to um, a constituent who said that their good friend thought they would be okay walking on the beach side and actually ended up getting, and their dog, tossed into a garage of someone's property across the street. And was actually really worried for the health of their dog. Yeah, um, I thought it was gonna drown. So that happens to be a good friend of mine who I, oh. I may have been the one to tell you that story. But I also heard that story from other people. I heard directly from him, and then I heard it from other people. Yeah. The, 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 the kind of waves, I mean, I did go to meet a reporter, which we um, didn't end up um, connecting. But one of my big things that I wanted to tell people at that time, and, and with additional king tides coming, if, if the public works or police sets up a barricade, there's a reason. Um, you know, if you want to walk down there, you can walk down there, but it's dangerous. If the waves can bring in a tree, they can knock you down in a heartbeat. That and when our first responders are already dealing with catastrophe and doing everything they can to try and keep everything together, the last thing a first responder needs is for somebody to put their life into danger on top of all of the work they're already doing trying to keep us safe. Especially in a town like Pacifica where at any given moment in time, maybe we don't have all the police officers on duty. We really wish we could because of staffing or money or both, or firefighters for that matter. If because somebody um, is ill-advised within enough 
to put themselves in harm's way. Now you're taking a professional first responder away from where we really wish they were um, lending their hand to save somebody who probably could have thought it through a little better. It's a whole interesting concept because they'll show it on the news and people want to come and look. And that's everybody's first response is, I want to go see what's happening. Um, n never, ever turn your back on the ocean. If, if you feel the need to be there, stay safe. Try not to get in harm's way because it can happen in a, in a heartbeat. Um, someone today was mentioning that they were at the beach in Lindemar and there were parents sitting in their lawn, in their lawn chair, sand chairs, and their kids were 35 feet away playing on the edge of the shore where the waves were coming in. And she, she walked up to them and said, do you understand what it's like? And they said, no, we, we can get our children. And she said, no, you can't. No, you can't. They're in, you, they need to, first of all, not be in the ocean. Second of all, you need to stay close to your children because things have happened. And especially with that kind of wave action, you with, never, ever, never. ever turn your back on the waves. Never. Ever. Um, now I'm gonna tell you a funny story. That would be About. welcome at this point because it, it didn't occur to me when I began going down this road that I'd be going straight from cancer and, uh, you know, children's, people's yes. children's yep. being washed away in the ocean. So please, so I tell it'd be this, I, I, I tell everyone that, you know, never turn your back to the ocean. And my husband and I used to walk on Lindemar Beach and we were at the very end and our friends were there and we were all standing around talking at the end and there I was with my back to the ocean not even thinking about it. And all of a sudden, and my friend Gary said, Sue, oh my God, and a big wave came. And while I, it was just like a cartoon, I was, my feet were going and going and the sand was going and going and going and going. I landed totally on the ground. And what happened? And the wave went over me. Luckily, it wasn't a king tide or it was what I'd call a sneaker wave. But now I'm at the very end of Lindemar Beach wearing jeans and shoes and a coat soaked to the bone. And if you asked my friend Gary or Russell or my husband, they will laugh to this day because it was not it was not fun for me, but they thought it was funny. So never, ever turn your back to the ocean because that's what I was doing. If I would have been turned the right direction, I'd have known it was coming. And sometimes we get to learn those lessons that are uh, told us so very often. Yes. Um, so just to <laughs> put the, the cherry on top of um, these stories. So going forward, and you know, hopefully there's uh, no more violence, and we'll see what the next batch of king tides do. Um, in terms of your health, so your past chemo, yep. your uh, pulmonary embolism, your, the it's breaking apart, the uh, blood uh, clots are breaking apart. Yes. What's the next step? Oh, some more fun cancer stuff. Um, so starting next Wednesday. I start radiation. Um, I have no idea what it's going to be like. So I'm going to stop you at this point because mm -hmm. we've, we've talked pretty thoroughly now about cancer and I'm not suggesting we shouldn't. And frankly, you know, you might consider talking more about radiation and what that's like in future episodes. But I think it's really important to understand that you're somebody whom I mean, I don't know if the people are aware that you hold literal world records for weightlifting. And that spirit of being a fighter can come off a certain way on the dais from time to time. And we'll talk about that in a minute, too. But the fact of the matter is, what's intrinsically the Sue Vaterlaus I know is a fighter through and through. And sometimes it comes off as a petty squabble. But the woman I know, it comes off as this warrior 
who will be fighting cancer and still be up on that dais more often than not trying to think through with us these complex issues that affect the entire community. You're going to be there as our mayor going through the radiation. And by the way, if you need to lean on your mayor pro tem a little bit, there's you know, absolutely no shame in that. The amazing right. thing is that you've decided to take on this responsibility while publicly fighting this battle and showing us all a little bit what that looks like when um, somebody puts the fullness of their heart into the entirety of their living. Um, I believe wholeheartedly in Pacifica. I've lived here since 1979. Um, I really care about what happens here. I, um, and, and like I said, once I say I'm gonna do something, I do it. Um, I am a fighter, which sometimes comes off the wrong way. Um, but, but I, I do have heart and I do care and that's why I do it and that's why I continue. So, you know, people form opinions and frankly, sometimes you do little to dissuade them of their opinion. I'm going to come out and say it. That's about as much as I'm coming out and saying. Because frankly, you know, why I was really excited to have this interview was that I've had the opportunity to know you since you were on planning commission when we were both just sitting in the audience and I don't even remember what they were talking about up there but you were kind of at odds with yourself because whatever they were talking about you really wanted to comment and you weren't quite sure if you should and you're you know saying to me you know I don't know if I should comment or not to which my response was well if you have something to say go say it for heaven's sake and that, that was the first moment I became in any way specifically aware of you. Whether or not we'd interacted before then, I, I frankly couldn't tell you. But that was the moment that I started noticing, okay, here's a person and she cares and she wants to express that and is not sure the right way to do it. And from there, from that point on, I've had opportunities to literally walk miles with you, which usually translates mm -hmm. to the Relay for Life track, mm -hmm. you know, appropriately enough. But I've had the opportunity to, you know, hang out with you when we're in Sacramento doing conference stuff, and then after we're conferencing, you know, we go back and talk about whatever, and just, you know, talking about your early life and your father and some of your early childhood. And so I, I get the unique opportunity that I get to see this like full spectrum of you. Whereas the community sometimes, you know, they think you're that person that um, demeans them as, as being dog walkers and that's the entirety of, you know, or you're that evil realtor who only cares about, you know, making sure other realtors are. And so this was an exciting opportunity for me because on top of their perception of you, you also have a personal perception of you. One in which you are uh, less inclined to say very much and don't usually have much to say. And I'll tell you something, um, Madam Mayor, as somebody who has spent hours on end having conversations with you on the phone, usually when I'm driving around in my car, I call you for one thing and five hours later, I'm like, oh my God, she's still going on about this. Is she going to stop? And I'm being glib, because if I truly wish to get off the phone, I'd just hang up at that point, I'm sure, I, and without even insulting you. I know blessed well that you absolutely have plenty to say and that's the point. And so on this one hand we have a, a perception of some public that views you as abrasive in whatever way and on the other hand you have this self-perception. Now we've already gone a half an hour together and I know that you have this idea that you want to reduce this down to a half hour long show and maybe you will but this is still in premise my show and if this is the last hour long one we have for a while we're halfway there and we still have plenty to say is all I'm saying. So let's talk about you a little bit more and who you actually are. Um, I do have a lot to say. Um, on council, I think I'm a little bit different um, than in my regular life because I really want to make things concise. I want to get to my point and sometimes that'll be it for me. When 
I have heard that it would be a lot better sometimes to um, include why I think that way, not just what it is that my, that my opinion is. It's, um, it's probably better to give a little more information. Um, certain times I have such a strong opinion that I make it even shorter because I could go on and on and I don't really want to do that because sometimes I feel like if I just say the one thing that it'll go through to the people. It won't be, oh my God, she's talking on and on and they've already forgotten what I had to say. So sometimes if I say one thing, then I feel like, well, that's, that's all I need to say right now. And, and sometimes I could definitely elaborate on why I think the way I do. And um, it's, it's interesting because in my speech, I said that I wanted to be more compassionate. And I saw Anita Reese after and she said, you're totally wrong because you're one of the more compassionate people that I know. So it's not being compassionate, it's portraying the compassion that I actually do have. You know, walking that Relay for Life track is when I, I felt like I started really getting to know you. you know, there was the beginning and then there was, okay, when am I starting to connect with someone? And I think that having the opportunity to, and this is even before I'm on council at this point, just walking the track with you, and pick your brain about whatever the issue of the day happened to be. And you probably did give the short answer. And you know, for those who aren't aware, I spent many years before I was ever on council just showing up because I figured that's what a good citizen probably should do. And I was trying to become a better human being for personal reasons. And, and so I was probably at whatever council discussion that you probably gave a relatively short answer to the thing. And then I had the opportunity to discuss it with you around the track. And it was a completely different thing that unfolded. And plus, I, then I get to discuss it with you, right? It's not just this passive mm -hmm. exercise of you say a short thing, whatever that is, and then there's not necessarily this wider view. It's I see the wider view so that that enables me, oh, well, maybe now I don't necessarily wholeheartedly agree with the position, but maybe now I have some understanding of why. And then I got to talk about it with you mm -hmm. and share perspective. And you're very open to sharing perspective. I am. You know, that's, that's something that I feel like sometimes might be um, missed by some of the folks who are watching. And then, you know, now that I'm there on the dais with you, I, I feel like, I had that opportunity to converse, which is something I often wanted to do when I was in the audience and couldn't. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that opportunity that now in real time we can have those discussions and flesh out thought processes. And that, that is one of my goals, to, um, to try to explain more about what, how, I, how I got to that point. I know I said that earlier, but, but it really, I think, will help because I think that, that people perceive me as being curt sometimes. Um, and um, I'm really not a, a curt person. I've, um, I've been on so many committees here that um, I started on a committee called um, City Facility Site Plan, trying to see whether we were going to move City Hall or not, maybe 20 something years ago, and finance, and oftentimes, and then planning, and then council, and then council again. So for, I don't know how many years I've been on committees, and I think I, and some of the committees had so many people, you just had to be succinct, and to the point, or your point never got accomplished. So I think I learned maybe then um, to, to be succinct in what I was saying, 
and, and and like I said, sometimes that comes across as curt or or um, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of another word that that people have said about me. Well, you know, it, maybe we shouldn't dwell too much on what others have said upon you. That's true. Um, and I, I agree, especially in larger committees, mm -hmm. um, it's, it becomes a courtesy to become succinct mm -hmm. and to be able to tell the story uh, as quickly as possible. I hear myself being redundant, but my style is to too. often tell the story twice. And what I have found, because frankly I received positive feedback at some point, Sure, on the 20 person Peninsula Clean Energy Committee I serve on, for example, I try to get in with my comment and get out as quickly as possible. But with council, there's five of us, and I, I find that I'm most successful, apparently, when I'm trying to tell it a couple different ways so that a couple different audiences are able to hear it. Because in my experience, what one group might hear when I say it this way, that other group didn't quite catch. And so I have to repeat it to try and catch as many people, at least in the thought process, again, even if at the end of the day, none of these folks necessarily agree with me. It's, um, th there are fine lines and we're, we're different and that's a good thing. Yep. Um, we, I, I'm glad we're different um, because if we were all the same, the whole thing would be boring. It would be ridiculous because we don't all agree. And that's why we all got elected because we are all different. We have different ways of saying things. We have different ways of accomplishing our end goal. Um, and we do go about it in different manners. To which my response of course is then the important thing is what we're really trying to accomplish is figuring out what policy decisions we make that we can both live with because this is the community for both of us from very different perspectives, right? And, and there is a compromise sometimes. I've, I've had times where I just didn't agree and sometimes where I was the one out of four that voted no and other times where, you know, you just make a compromise and you're always there to do the best for the community because that's why we serve. It is a service that we do. We spend a lot of time, more time than people can ever imagine. I think when people are new and they get on council, they're surprised at the amount of time and work that we actually do go through. Yeah. And the unknown things, how many people are gonna contact me today about this? How many people wanna know about that? What about pickleball? What about raccoons? Um, tell me about the bowling alley. I mean, there are so many things involved in being a council person. Um, we couldn't really do anything without our staff. The staff is so important to us. They do so much background work. They, um, they help us do our jobs. They inform us, they educate us. All of the staff, the, the city manager's office, the Sarah, our wonderful, wonderful clerk, um, our, the police, we have a new amazing chief, um, Parks Beach and Recreation, we're doing just new things there. Um, and I did want to bring up the, one of the interesting things that someone mentioned to me is that the head of our public works department is a woman. The head of our police department is a woman. Um, our mayor is a woman. Um, and there are a lot of good opportunities for women. Um, and, and it's an empowering thing to do. 
our assistant city manager. Our assistant city, city manager, clerk, our um, mayor pro tem. Yes, <laughs> most of our council. Yeah, I'm a lucky guy. Yeah, <laughs> um, but but you know that it's um. And my sister asked me the other day, "How does it feel to be famous?" And I went, "I'm not famous." And she goes, "Oh yes, you are. Yes, you are." She goes, I read about you all the time. So it's a whole different kind of uh, change that goes on when you're actually, some people think you're famous. And sometimes people walk up to you and say hi uh, in amazing ways, like, oh my God, how are you? And sometimes, we don't know who they are <laughs> because they know who we are yeah. and we don't necessarily know who they are. Wow, did I go in a big circle? You know, you're bringing it home. That's the important part. Um, and of course, I can really, I think, you know, just from time at Safeway, I would meet so many people who would know who I was, who, you know, I wish I knew them, but I would always say, well, people tend to know who I am and I try to know who they are as often as I can. And, you know, now with, the political life on top of it, it's just on steroids, right? So we have about 10 minutes left or so, and I, I would like to get a little bit even deeper, more personal, as though cancer wasn't personal enough. No, right? it was pretty personal. But, but let's talk about young Sue Vaterlaus and where you came from and who you are independent of Pacifica and politics and policy and discussion. Um, who it, it, it's an interesting thing because I recently I was thinking about politics because I was involved in a lot of committees with the Association of Realtors and legislative and I went to Sacramento and Washington DC and met with legislators and I actually told the head of our government affairs that I'm not political. I, I am not political. And he goes, you just don't know. And I realized just recently that when I was in junior high school and I went to a public school in the East Bay and the girls, because we were girls, had to wear dresses to school every day in the rain. Now it didn't snow in the East Bay, but it got cold and we were required in a public school to wear dresses every single day. And that was when I became political because I had enough and I didn't want to wear dresses to school anymore. I wanted to wear pants. So one of my friends and I started up and we fought and fought and fought. And it worked. By the time I was in, went to the high school from junior high, we were allowed to wear pants to school for the first time. And, and recently that dawned on me that that was extremely political. Um, I also, I went to San Francisco State and I lived in the dorms there and we were separated, the, the women by this time and the men had separate dorms. And I go, why? Why do we have separate dorms? We live together with men and women in other locations, why, why aren't we doing it? And we did that too. And we got, we actually got, we had the first co-ed dorm, I believe in the United States, at San Francisco State. We, um, I don't know how we did it, we sweet talked them. We got a kitchen put into one of the rooms. Um, we had a great time. And it wasn't the separation between men and women because men and women live together all the time. Very so cool. another, so I, I have been political my whole life. It's in your blood. It is. So I, I do want to ask you about your father in a moment, but I, since you touched on uh, your, your time as a realtor, mm -hmm. which uh, has been copious, of course, you know, that's politically in Pacifica, I feel like um, often they point to the realtor and say, evil realtor. And I, I joke with you about this yeah, quite we, often we do. And, you know, in very glib fashion. 
But frankly, the, the thing that made me want to run for council was Measure C. It was a rent control thing. And I landed in this very neutral place by the time it was over. And while I know that those who are big advocates of Measure C absolutely saw realtors as evil, and especially Sam Carr, which, by the way, I also don't agree with you know, Sam Carr coming in in that moment. I understand why they did. But nonetheless, I came to this neutral place because I was also very disappointed with the way Measure C came about from my perspective and happy to argue with anyone at any point in time, but that's, you know, the point of it being, I walked out of that process going, no, wait a minute, realtors are not evil. Y'all couldn't agree for nothing, and I think that was the problem with that process, was it was not a process conducive toward building any kind of uh, understanding, coalition, bring together for the purpose of creating something as a community, but it was quite the opposite. It was very divisive. And I came out of it making many friends with realtors. And so I kind of then approached that relationship with you as somebody who understood, no, realtors aren't necessarily evil. It's only recently I came to understand, in point of fact, Sam Carr works with Cora. So you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time, because I, I want to get to know you a little better, but Sam Carr does for Cora. Tell us, tell us something about oh, that. Sam Carr um, does a lot of um, things. We do programs with Heart also, where. Um, and by the way, Cora is uh, communities organized uh, against relationship abuse. Yes, um, it's it's important to the people there. We we also Sam Carr contributes to Samaritan House and uh, Caminar, which is a um, a disabled um, person's home. Um, they do a lot of work with people with mental disabilities. Um, and Hart is Housing Endowment and Regional Trust. And um, for years, we've done um, assistance with that. Um, realtors, realtors really are not here to make money. I mean, our whole goal in life is to help people. We help people get into rentals. We help people get out of rentals. We sell houses. We help people buy houses. And generally, it's a positive experience. But one of the things that people don't appreciate about realtors is that we do believe in personal property rights. And that's really important to realtors, and that's why Sometimes it comes off in a different manner because we do believe in that. And as far as the rent control, the rent control in the end failed in the city. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but 68%, 72%. Well, let's, let's not uh, grab at numbers when we don't remember specifically what I, they I are. I don't remember specifically, um, but it was but, you know, it was a fairly overwhelming um, vote against rent control. And, and as I hear you talking about realtors, you know, I can hear some of the folks who may be in the audience and some of their thought processes going, like, hell, you don't, uh, you know, want profit for yourself as a realtor. And property rights, you know, are um, anathema at some point to people being able to afford housing. But that being said, what I also heard was that Sam Carr is helping Cora and Hart and Kaminar, and that there really is, from my perspective, a heart to what the realtors are doing as an organization. And I feel very strongly as somebody who, again, fell into this very neutral place mm -hmm. and made good friends as realtors during that process. And it was a heck of a process for it's, me. Yeah, and we but, do work for money, but, that, I, but so does everyone. It feels so strongly that if, if the realtors and the housing advocates could figure out more productive ways to get together, we could all get just a little bit closer. We could. And I, I don't need you know anybody right now to say, oh yes, realtors are saints, or oh yes, the housing advocates clearly know what they're talking about when it comes to property management. But like, if we could like figure out a way to get the conversation a little closer, as somebody who does not view realtors as evil, just saying. It, it, would, be, um, it would be nice. It would be nice. It would be, if we all could just talk together we have. and have 
good conversations. We have a little bit of time left. And Very like little. I see, see, we could use another half hour. No. Wow. <laughs> um, tell us about your father. Um, well, that, that's interesting that I even delved into that, but starting early in my life, um, there were three kids in my family and my mother and my father, and my father went out one day to go sailing in the bay on a sailing, um, they were in a race, he and his good friend, um, who was good friends with my mother, and um, he never came back. He and his friend died that day when I was four, my brother was two, and my sister was five. Your father died out at sea? In the bay. Um, his best friend also died. Um, you know, my mother had three children. She was pregnant with her first, and she lost her husband. And um, it was interesting growing up that way. Because every day, my, every day my brother would wake up and go, where's my daddy? Where's my daddy? And he was never coming back. So that was, I guess, maybe that was part of my strength growing up. You had to be strong. Had to be. Had to mature quick, become strong, mm -hmm. and uh, ultimately fight for your family. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, it would seem that um, as you have found your role to this point as mayor. You know, disagree with you or not, I would damn well wager you probably view all Pacifica as your family at this point. I am so happy with the support, everything I've gotten from people, the number of people who have said to me, whatever you need, I'll bring it to you. Do you need food? Do you need me to drive you somewhere? Do you want whatever you want? whatever you want. I was having a bad day one day and I was out and I came back and I had flowers around my room and just went, oh my, I have this support. And I'm so thankful to be in Pacifica and know the people that I know here. And just everybody, everyone is wonderful and caring here. And if you ever need anything, there'll be people here to help you, always. So, Madam Mayor, you are a fighter. It would seem that you're a fighter for this community and it seems as though um, you're letting this community help you as you need it. And so, uh, as we go forward, uh, let's fight together. Okay, uh, together. Well, important you know, word. I mean, we'll probably fight together, but <laughs> an important uh, word. Let's let's fight with uh, one another toward a common goal. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm so looking forward to your year as mayor, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with this office now that it is yours. Okay. So Pacifica, welcome to the mayor's office.